okay, let's see, what are we doing today? Oh, yes, <laughs> we are working on tone paper uh, and we're doing a landscape. And they, we'll do a couple of little exercises to start off with. And then we'll have a, you know, a little over a half hour, probably about 40 minutes to do a drawing um, step by step. But it's going to be one that uses techniques that you've been using already. We're just going to be trying to apply them in a pretty specific manner. So let me go ahead and get started. Share the screen here. Okay, folks, it's uh, time for another summer of drawing, <laughs> class number 13. And so we're still on the subject of home. And I'm sure by now you're, you're like wondering how many possible ways we can find to extend this subject matter. But in this case today, we're going to be working on a scene, a landscape called the Old Homestead. And this is, this is the scene we'll be using today. The idea is that we're gonna be working on, color, on toned paper um, and drawing something that we can't really see a lot of detail, but we're trying to get a sense of, of you know, a big sky, uh, some you know, sort of dilapidated buildings. In this particular case, what I um, was looking at mostly was this idea that we could use direction, the direction of the pencil stroke to help us draw things like roofs, the, the shingled siding or the, the slat siding uh, and the scene in, in general without having to get into a lot of detail. I was working on the, the version I did, it's about, you know, about five by seven, not very large at all. It, it's not really the ideal size at which to do something detail where you are trying to show, uh, you know, big planks of wood and that kind of thing. But it's a good way to just start mentally thinking that whenever we draw, we should be thinking about pencil direction and how that helps a scene. So in this particular case, the uh, interpretation being the old homestead, homes of the past, the way we have lived in years before, even you know curiosity about who lived here and what was their life like. But what, from a drawing point of view, it's really the atmosphere, uh, an abandoned home, a very quiet scene and, and a big sky. So how to interpret the scene? What are we drawing here? We don't have a lot of darks. We have these three dark buildings. We've got, we've got a sense of, of a foreground, a midground. We've got the sky. We have the very pale um, clouds, but how to make a decision about what's gonna happen in here. It's going to require manipulating a little bit the, uh, the, the values that we see, the distant landscape, what's up closer, um, you know, what, what do we do with that blue sky in general? So what I want to um, just run through for a few minutes while we're thinking about this, about how to do this interpretation is some of these illustrations, uh, these drawings by Frank Rines. And I've brought him up before I know, um, I, I've talked about, um, I've got the, the book here, which I can show again later, um, a, a better approach to pencil drawing that was put out in, I think the 1930s by Frank Rines. And, um, these are, these are other illustrations. A couple of them appear in this book, but these are other drawings by him. And what I wanted to show in particular is how he is using a beveled pencil um, to a great extent in his drawings to really get that sense of directional line. He is, he is forcing our eyes this way and that. He's showing contrast in lines when it comes to drawing buildings. And so when we're drawing buildings, it's a perfect excuse for using the beveled pencil end, because it gives some nice straight uh, strokes that sort of fill in spaces, but they're interesting. So we're not necessarily talking about massing uh, an area like, like we would in with academic drawing, where we're trying to make it so smooth that we can't even tell variation. In this case, we actually want variation, but because we can't have variation everywhere, it would get so confusing. We've got to use the hardness of the pencil leads, you know, 4H, 2H, H, HB, to be, et cetera, um, to get the lightness and the darkness. And then we have to use variety in the pencil stroke and how much stroke we have where. Now to do a drawing like this takes a couple of hours. This is not, the drawing like this is not going to be done in, in a half hour, but the idea, the decision-making about what lines you put where, how much you show. So let's just talk about a couple of things in this particular drawing. One of them is the cobblestone streets. So over on the left hand side to the left of where the guy is pointing up in the up in the air, you can see a few cobbles are indicated. This is just like that drawing that we did of that of the uh, um, the archway where we weren't going to put uh, we didn't put texture everywhere, but we put it in certain places, usually where there's a little bit more darkness, a little bit more contrast to represent to symbolize the fact that there are cobblestones everywhere here. And then as as the 
road goes further back, you would be able to see less detail. And so rather than having lots of little dots going all the way to the back, it just turns into very light line work. But there's a distinction between the shaded area and the not shaded area. Uh, likewise, in the trees, you know, there's some variation to the stroke direction. There's uh, dark and light. You get a really good sense of contrast. And then as the scene disappears, you have uh, lighter lines, less contrast, lighter pencils, uh, less dark areas, so that you get, you know, the, as well as the perspective, you get the proper sense of proportion. So this takes a while to do. And if you were draw, drawing a drawing like this old homestead in this manner, you know, you'd have to really sort of plan out what are you going to do when, uh, which strokes to use where. And that's sort of what we're going to do today. So I'm going to show you a few more of, of Reins's drawings just because they're really applicable. Let's see. And thank you, uh, who, whoever said that the uh, um, the book is available at the library. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, so you can use this for, for modern buildings as well. Really great for things like uh, skyscrapers, tall buildings. Um, using a beveled pencil is a great way to do windows relatively quickly and get sort of an even tone to them. Now, Frank Rines is working large, okay? He's working... Uh, 16 by 20, 18 by 24 for some of these. So he's using, you know, he's got a lot of room, a lot of arm room. If we're going to be working in inches, of course, we'll be able to get less stuff in there. But the whole idea of being able to, to really get some suggestive marks, some dark marks using um, the bevel pencil is, is really helpful. At the same time, uh, you'll find at some point in your drawing today that you're going to want to get more detail than a pe bevel pencil will, will let you use. You'll be able to sort of tilt your pencil lead up a little bit and use the front edge of it, the leading edge of it, to get some lines. But you can also, you know, just pull out your other pencils, mechanical pencils, anything with a, a good point on it, to get details like, uh, like he has going on in the, these buildings in the background. And you'll also see a certain amount that Frank Rines used a certain amount of line as well as mass. So everything doesn't have to be uh, a beveled pencil. Everything doesn't have to be a mass uh, of, of value. You can, def if you feel like you need a line defining something somewhere, you know, go for it. The, as usual, I'll just suggest not outlining absolutely everything, trying to make some decisions about why you're putting a line in a particular place. But if you feel it's needed for definition, go for it. So this is much more like what we're going to be um, trying to do today. Of course, uh, not as large as what he has here, but I thought this was a great example so that you can see how by following the, the actual perspective of the building, according to which side you're drawing, um, and also changing the uh, darkness of the pencil that you're using, the, maybe the pressure of the pencil that you're using, um, and definitely uh, perhaps how much pencil you're putting down. I would say those are the sort of the three things to look at. And then look at how he's treated that foreground grass, which is sort of like what we're going to be doing today, um, trying to figure out how to get that feeling of vegetation versus the feeling of, of the building. I want to also point out he's, he's putting in, in some of these drawings a little bit of the sky. And so when you're drawing on white paper, it's a little more difficult because, of course, white paper, white clouds, what do you do? In this case, and in what most artists do, is you just sort of try to show a little bit either of the darker area of the cloud or um, maybe a little bit of the blue sky close to the cloud. <laughs> and I'll show you an example of that in just a second here. So to get back to buildings, you know, here we go again. We've got more weathered buildings. A lot of these actually were from the, uh, the I think, the Newport area, um, or places around Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, he did a lot of drawing. So we've got a lot of buildings that look like this, and it's really applicable. Um, and he came back, so he would do, you know, perhaps one or two layers of different pencil strokes and then come back with a darker pencil to get that feeling of the weathered board uh, casting a little bit of shadow. It, just a really great way without you even really noticing it until you actually look closely to see that he's using directional lines all over the place to give a, a sense of life. Now, for those people who really love blending, <laughs> you can still do some blending on the lower uh, levels if you want to. But but this idea of getting vitality in your drawing really does uh, depend quite a bit on, on expressive pencil stroke and also 
on changing, you know, how these values are put down and changing your line direction. So really you want to mix a lot of a lot of different techniques together to get a lively looking drawing. Here's another example. Now here's a, a case where he's getting that feeling in the sky of of you know of a direction and a sweep that sort of goes along with the, with the whole angle of the road. So when we're tre treating skies in general, they they do need to stay in the background. They're they're definitely supposed to be uh, in the background. But you can get a situation like the image we'll be working from today, where the sky is actually very important. In this drawing, the sky is not important. So you've got a little bit of direction. You can see how uh, he's indicated a little bit of the blue of the sky very lightly, left the clouds kind of light and fuzzy. You don't really notice the sky at all. It's secondary to the tree and the building and the direction and composition of the drawing. Um, all of these things work together to make a, a drawing really work. Now, I know that Frank Rines's look is very conservative and traditional and harkens back to a different type of drawing than most people do today. But I'm going to uh, reiterate that that copying a few of his drawings and getting that type of pe pencil technique under control will just help you so much when you're out drawing and sketching by yourself. These are really solid lessons. And even if you end up doing something extremely contemporary and abstract, being able to control your pencil like this is really useful. Okay, so I'm bringing up the picture again that we're gonna be working from because this uh, drawing here really does sort of, of go along with it. We're gonna be dealing with a rather broken down looking buildings. Things are not all very even. This isn't a painted building or anything like that. You know, we've got some sagging roofs. We've got some, uh, looks like moss or something growing on them. Um, and then we've got this huge sky that we're dealing with as well, which we'll be very lucky. We're going to be working on tone paper. And so we won't have to worry about the blue. We really only have to worry about the white. But we do have all of this vegetation going on up front and trying to figure out, you know, what, what are we going to do about that, about the different values? It's a perfect time to, to think that uh, stroke direction and varying the actual pencil uh, weight um, not only just the, uh, the the pencil lead, but also perhaps how light and dark we're actually drawing. All of those can uh, go together to to make a difference between the vegetation at the front, the buildings, the middle ground, which is the land kind of right behind the buildings, and then those very very distant hills, because we've got all of those different areas that we want to represent in some different manner. So I loved this Frank Rhine's drawing just because I liked what he did with with all of the rocks, you know, the different directions representing all the different planes. And then of course, the varying lines that allows a lot of the white of the paper to come through for the building. Now, when we're working on the tone paper today, you're going to find that a little bit challenging because there isn't a white of the paper to come through. In fact, some of your pencil lines may be very close in value to the paper that you're working on. I certainly found that and the, the pictures that we'll look at of what I did, um, don't look quite like they do in real life. Um, you can see a lot more sort of variation in, in real life uh, because of the of the graphite and how, how well that scans. So in that case, what we have to do is we have to go, okay, are there going to be places where even if there aren't white highlights that we might need to just lighten our pencil a little bit with a little bit of white charcoal or something to kind of get some interest and vitality into the scene. So I'm going to play this little video that if you guys were here from the very first uh, uh, class, you'll have seen this before. This is me going over the beveled pencil concept again. I'm doing this for people who've joined us more recently and perhaps haven't seen that. And also just as a refresher about how, you know, how we're using these pencils. So what we've got here are just pencils where I have shaved a lot of the lead back and then used a little bit of sandpaper to create about a 45 inch, uh, 45 degree bevel at the, at the end of each of these pencils. The idea being that rather than using just the pointy tip, which you can see on the uh, pencil that's the second from the left, that we're using a, a flatter end. We're using these pencils, in other words, as tools to lay down graphite in different ways. So I usually have a set of, of uh, pencils that I have already done this to. But even if I've got regular pencils and I want to quickly you know, put a bevel on, I can just use something like an emery board to make that happen. But this is an abbreviated version of that 
first video that we saw talking about the materials. If, if you've watched this before, while this is playing for the few minutes, um, go ahead and start warming up with some pencil, uh, um, just some doing some drawing with, with the beveled ends, get your hands sort of flowing. And I'm gonna show a little bit of that at the same time too. Let me just get this started here. So uh, one thing I tend to do if I'm doing a larger drawing is I use a larger sketching pencil as well, also uh, at 45 degrees. So this is just one of the, uh, the various different types of pencils that, that you can use. And I use these two um, sorts of, of erasers as well. Uh, an emery board for uh, knocking down the end, or you can use one of these fancy little pieces of sandpaper, or you can just use a regular piece of sandpaper to, to keep your uh, end where you want it. And then for sharpening, this is just a really quick review. Um, I keep a little pen knife. And what I do is I keep hold the pen knife still, and I move the pencil. I find it just easier for me to get some control and not necessarily knock the end of the pencil off. So here's me doing a few uh, little exercises if you guys wanna draw along with whatever uh, pencils you have. It goes in and out of focus a little bit, I'm afraid, because it keeps focusing on the end of the, of the pencil, which isn't helpful. But the idea is that you can either do large areas pretty quickly um, of a relatively consistent value, uh, depending on the, the um, hardness of the lead, whether you're using like a 2H or 4H or an HB, you'll get these different values. So what you're looking for is to use a firm pressure so that you're not, uh, you're relying on the pencil lead, the hardness of the lead to give you the changing in the change in the value um, rather than necessarily just relying on, on pressure. Although you can, you can definitely do both. Uh, you know, as, as you go along. But it's just an interesting um, way to do it. Now, here's me using that the same type of pencil lead uh, softness, but with just a regular point like we normally use. And you'll see there's quite a difference in, um, you know, in, in what you get out of it. So, you know, different pencils for different, uh, different techniques, doesn't matter which one you use. In this case, what we'll be doing today is more where we're, we're showing gaps. Um, just just like these various lines here. And I think I did a uh, one or two where I'm just going a little bit darker. So this is just a really fast way to be able to, um, you know, get a whole bunch of color down without, uh, you know, without having to, to, to do the kind of the more academic drawing where you do the, the you know, the little ovals and, and that sort of the little hatching. Um, you know, this beveled pencil ends just having a few of these around and you might only need like two or three. You might find that there are certain pencils that you use all the time, like a 2H, an HB and a 2B or something like that. And you keep those in your in your pencil drawer uh, or your pencil box or whatever, um, you know, ready to go. But I often find that if I have a regular pencil um, and I just want that that look, I can just actually just draw, um, you know, make a little block where I just go over and over again on the side of my page and, and wear that pencil end down to a 45 degree angle if I'm really looking for that and I don't have anything on, on hand. So that's just a quick review. Um, for those of you who haven't done this before or just to, to sort of give you a little bit of a reminder because this will be quite a bit of what we're doing today. If you don't have any pencils already, you know, beveled to that this end, do not worry. Um, you can, you know, you'll be able to do the same type of, of concept just using your regular pencil, but it's just really good to know that this is a, an approach that you can take. All right, I think that's enough of that. <laughs> and we'll, we'll head on to the next step. Oops, there we go. Okay, so what I'd like you to do before we even get to the no tan stage, so time, just do a tiny little drawing where you're thinking about the Frank Rhines approach. Do a very quick sketch of this, scheme, of this scene, planning out how you might approach the pencil stroke direction. Don't worry about details or proportions or anything like that. I can't see what you're doing. <laughs> um, so just sort of go, okay, you know, we've got some distant land, mid ground. We've got some stuff going on up front. Um, we've got let's see, roofs, we've got different sides of buildings, we have this windmill, and we have the sky. So we're working on tone paper, we don't have to worry about the blue of the sky. But you know, are, are you going to want to add 
some line work into into the sky i'm you know that's going to be completely up to you i didn't i didn't do that myself but it's something to think about you know how are you going to want what's going on up front to be different from what's going on in the back so the reason um i i suggest doing this you, and it's not something that you have to do you know all the time by any means but it is often useful as i've said frequently <laughs> this summer to go through a few iterations of, of your drawing of what you want to draw before you get started. And this is even if you're sitting out there looking at a scene like this and you're and you're ready to draw um, to take a few minutes to do a couple of thumbnails. You know, one might be a no tan, one might be, uh, you know, something that where you're thinking about the stroke direction and how you plan on going about it just to give yourself an idea. It's so much easier to do this up front than it is to do later on. Now, when I was working on tone paper today, I worked on a very soft type of paper called Reeves paper. It's just another uh, another brand. It's a very soft paper that's often used for printmaking as well. But it, one of the uh, wonderful things about it is the texture. And one of the awful things about it is the texture. It's got a very soft texture, which means it's extremely easy um, you know, when you're even when you're erasing with like a kneaded rubber eraser and trying to be really careful, it lifts the top layer of the paper off. And because of that, you want to have a plan as you're going in and some sort of idea of, you know, of where where is this all going to go? How are you going to go about it? Um, and I just really find having a little sketch where you've just kind of figured out, hmm, OK, here's what I'm thinking that this is a good way to get started. OK, so wrap this up because we'll go ahead now and do a no tan. I'm just gonna move us right into the next, um, whoops. Oh, actually, I, and I just wanted to show you again, the close up sort of the, you know, the, the potential idea of how you can go about dealing with this sort of line work. Now you'll get this PDF after the class, of course, or if anyone's watching on the video, all of these are, all the PDFs are available on my website on the art classes page uh, to download. So you'll be able to look at these pictures a lot more closely uh, later and really study them and, and even, you know, try to draw something just like this uh, if you want to yourself. And I, I highly recommend it. Actually, there's one thing that is very interesting that doesn't really apply too much to what we're doing today. It does a little bit. Okay, if you look at the foreground grasses, right where they hit the bottom of the building, if you squint a little bit, you'll notice there's kind of a light ridge running along there. See how Frank's, Frank Rhines just sort of eliminated the pencil strokes as they got close to the building. That's a little, that's an interesting technique that's good to use. Uh, if it's on white paper, you can just sort of eliminate the strokes. If it's on tone paper, like it is today, that's a place where you might want to think about just adding a little bit of white charcoal near the end. And you'll sort of see that as we go. So, oops, I guess before we get to the no tan, I, had to, I wanted to talk a little bit more about clouds. I'd forgotten about that. So clouds, they can either be part of the background or they can be a, a real integral part of the drawing like they are in this particular image. So I'm just gonna show you a few uh, drawings that I did from my travel sketchbook, trying to decide, you know, okay, what type of clouds are we drawing today? Are they a backdrop for what's going on? Um, what kind of action do they have? You know, are they slowly drifting? Or are they quickly scudding across the sky? Are there, are there lots of them? Is the action of the, uh, of the clouds themselves important? Um, how much of the clouds do you need to show? Uh, in this case, some clouds were coming in over the over the horizon, and I just thought the simplified shape was enough. I didn't need to draw them in, in a great deal of detail. Um, sometimes you just want the clouds there to balance out your scene, and it's they're not such an important part of the drawing. But in our image, the, the clouds are pretty important. They're they sort of represent this big sky, the loneliness of the homestead out there. And so we are going to want to have them in. Um, it's one of those things that you'll just keep in mind as you're actually going along. Okay, now it's time for the no tan. So once again, just, you know, let's take about five minutes or so to do a little no tan, just a little drawing where you're looking at the lights and darks. Now, Often when I do a no tan for uh, on tone paper, I'll throw in some of the lights too, just because in this case, I was like, I need to, I need to think about these clouds and, and, you know, what design will the lights of the clouds make as well as the dark. And then there was the problem of the foreground <laughs> and actually of the background. <laughs> um, 
you know, if you just draw what's actually the darkest, which are three buildings in the windmill, they're kind of disassociated from each other. And that's when I, I looked around and said, well, what can be possibly made a little bit darker? Or if not actually made darker, at least I'm going to emphasize these areas to a certain extent to make sure that there's a little bit of unity. So you don't have to necessarily join things up. I've got a, a little dark area running up where that blue ridge in the, in the distance is. I've got a little dark area running up through there. I know I'm not going to make it that dark because that would kind of shift the feeling of, of distance. But it's sort of a reminder that something has to be done with that background uh, in order for it, there to be a little bit of unity to the drawing. Now, in a, in a four by or five by seven drawing, you can't get but so much of that of that feeling of variation of of uh, value of, of texture and such but i think regardless of the size that you plan to draw in it's really really useful just to have these few moments up front to to think out what you're actually doing when i uh, go to uh, meet someone to um you know that i'm going to to uh, do a portrait of I find that uh, you know the amount of time that I take just sort of talking to someone up front, um, you know, a kind of sort of a second like interview. You know, I'm interested in the person and what they're doing, and um, you know, whatever the subject it happens to be that um, pertains to to the portrait, that kind of thing. But it gives me an opportunity to look at the person and start to get ideas of of what I could be doing, you know, for a composition or how the light might look best on them or what kind of gestures do they make. And you start to record this in your head. And I find the notan and these upfront sketches and these little plans, it's not because this is a big, horrific, you know, process and everything has to be really <laughs> over overdone. It's more that, hey, let me just have a take a few minutes, have a little bit closer look, um, have a bit of fun with this because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. No one else is going to see it. And I'm just sort of figuring out for myself how I might go. But it does give me some ideas and, and a little bit of a, a little little bit of a thought that I might change as I go along. I might decide to do something different. But I at least this way I have identified um, what has to what what the potential problems are and what potential solutions are as well. So just uh, go ahead and finish this up. I'm just going to take a slip of coffee here. I still have my little frog in my throat from last week, but so far so good. <laughs> And I, I hope some of what we were talking about last week when I was uh, reading from Speed's uh, book from the 1913, uh, yeah, 1913, um, talking about, you know, why, why we do outline and how, how we think about objects. I hope that that has uh, provided some food for thought. I think I'm, I'm listening to a, another uh, audio book right now. A fellow was talking about, you know, why do why do we paint and draw? You know, what is the what is the nature of humans that that makes us do this? I don't necessarily I know that I agree with all of what this fellow is saying, so I'm not sure I'm going to be reading you excerpts. But it is so very interesting to hear what non artists think about why artists do what they do, and I I think that to a certain extent. Um, it is, it's good for artists to weigh in on this, to try to figure out, you know, why, why are we so interested in certain scenes? Why do we draw? Um, how, do, how do we draw? Very fascinating stuff. All right, let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to get to the very first step, which is using a light pencil to carefully sketch the main angles of the scene, checking your angles by holding your pencil up to the scene, and carefully moving your hand to the drawing. Now, I know you can hardly see what's going on in the lower right-hand side because of the paper color I'm using. So I've, I've drawn, I've, I've done a version here so you can just look really carefully. Um, it's hard to see. I used extremely light lines because I know on this soft Reeves paper, and that's R-I-V-E-S, um, that it's going to be really difficult for me to erase without messing up the paper itself. So I've been super, super light, uh, light touch, probably using about a, I think a 2H pencil for this. And also where lines intersected the buildings and stuff, I just left them there because I know that the lines I'll be using next will, will color over that. So let's go back to where you can see the picture rather large. Now, what I haven't done, but you could definitely do if you were going to draw this again, 
is I haven't shown you the um, the buildings super big because I don't I really don't want you getting lost in the details. Um, it's so easy to get sucked in, and we're, we've got you know basically uh, you know three and a half buildings that we're trying to fit into the time frame plus this whole scene. What I'm more interested in is that you're trying to use different directional strokes when we get to that point. Um, and, and to start off with, your life will just be that much easier if you've taken the time to kind of measure out how these buildings are working. So what I did was the first, I, I sketched this twice, actually, the first couple of times, I kept putting the, the building in the, and the windmill in the middle, uh, and then I didn't have room for the other two buildings. So I got smart on the third go, <laughs> and I realized the center of the scene was the far right-hand side of the building. And I started there and, you know, built the one building out to the left from that point and then the same going the other direction. And that really helped. And this is um, if you find yourself having a situation like that where, you know, where you just keep running off the page, you don't have enough room for all your objects to be in. I, I look for those center lines. Another really useful line to look for is the horizon line. So often an artist will, even in painting or drawing, and particularly in landscape stuff, will put that line of the horizon in first. In this case, it's about um, a third of the way up from the, from the uh, bottom of the page. And so, you know, just really lightly indicating where that line is. Then where, where's the center? Where, where does the first building start? And like I said, I found that the right-hand side of that building on the left was kind of close to the center close enough for me to do something. We're not going to, you know, this isn't an architectural practice today, but it is nice to at least have the angles of the roofs and the uh, the slight tilt of that building on the left indicated. Um, as per usual, hold that pencil up to the photograph, have a look at that angle um, to double check what you've done, and then very carefully without moving the pencil, move back over to your artwork and double check that angle. Is it the same? And that's the easiest way. I usually do a quick sketch, you know, trying to do that by eye. And then I come back and I, you know, I double check it afterwards. And I do that first version by eye uh, because I'm trying to train myself to, to get those angles more closely on the first go round. Um, the other thing that I, I found very interesting about this scene is the sense that, uh, you know, where are these buildings in relation to each other? Um, it, you know, you can see sort of the, the dip of the land. It's difficult to tell. Are these buildings all in a row? Are they beside each other? What's the relative shape? Some things like that are very hard to determine in a scene like this. We don't really have a lot of other information. Um, they don't really overlap each other for us to see what's in front, what's behind. So we really do sort of have to rely on, on perspective, on the angles of the roof, that sort of thing, to sort of see, are they all lined up or are, you know, are any of these slightly uh, tilted? And it seems like the building on the left uh, might, be, might, might be slightly tilted. When it comes to the, um, the windmill itself and trying to sketch where that went, the four uprights and then a couple of circles just to show the inner and the outer uh, parameters of the, of the veins themselves are probably all you need to get started at this point, rather than trying to draw every single little individual one out. I know this is the, I know this part is, is, is probably one of the toughest parts of a drawing is getting this initial stuff laid out and trying to figure out how much information you're going to include and how much you're not going to include. When you see this image, larger uh, later on, you'll see that there's a lot of detail you probably didn't catch at all. But that's quite okay, because what we're going to do today with, um, you know, using beveled pencil, you're not going to be able to get a lot of detail in. In fact, it'll be a little frustrating, probably. Uh, on tone paper, um, we've, we've done the beveled pencil thing on light paper, and you can really see, you know, even a 2H or whatever, you can see those lines. It'll be depending on the color of paper you're using and the value, it'll change which pencils show up the best. But we'll still go through the same, the same basic motion. So let's go ahead and just move on to the next step. So the next step will be to start drawing in the buildings using beveled pencils of varying hardness. 
uh, to indicate the darker or lighter planks and the rooftops. Now, like I said, if you don't happen to have bevel pencils and you just want to do this with regular pencils, pencil uh, lead tips, that's perfectly okay. Um, I'm going to show you this a little bit larger. So, you know, you've got the roughness of the paper to deal with. You've got the roughness of the of the thicker pencil lead. Um, you've got the size that you're working at. All of these kind of make it difficult to know exactly, you know, what to do. That's why it's really important to have a, a plan before you start in about how you're going to deal um, with the various different angles on the buildings and also the angles on the roof. Now, I find that at this particular stage, when I'm doing this, you know, when I'm putting the first layer of what I call color in there, um, you end up with a lot of midtones. It's hard to tell the darks from the lights, but just, you know, get yourself started, usually using the lighter pencil first. Like you might want to try a 2H first, not go too dark too quickly. Um, particularly if you're working small, and just start to try to get these buildings in there. And I figured at the same time what I would do is add a little bit of the background and then the directional business of the vegetation. So let me give you the bigger picture back again uh, for you to work on. So I kept in mind that uh, idea that I had saw Frank Rines do where the, the top of the vegetation, if we squinted it now, you can probably see it even more clearly, the top of the vegetation running um, in front of the buildings is actually quite a bit lighter than what is down at, at the bottom of the photograph. And so that's something that we can accentuate. Uh, it helps give a dividing line between the foreground and the midground. But then there's that, like, what do we do about the background? So I just went ahead with, I think, a probably an H pencil and put some horizontal lines to represent that blue area in the background, hoping that as time went on, I'd figure out what to do. Um, I did find that this was a subject matter I would love to do a larger picture of, and perhaps even um, not have all three buildings, but perhaps just have the center one and the one on the left and the windmill, that would make a really nice composition. So that's, you know, I've talked about this before, but we don't have to just take our the imagery that we have, um, you know, and, and go, okay, this is the scene and it must look exactly like this. It's a good starting point, And particularly when you're making a plan and you're uh, getting your drawing worked out, you're trying to figure out what to do. But um, having drawn this now once and seen how actually difficult it is to draw, you know, these buildings small and get that directional feel in, I'm, I'm very much inclined to do a scene that's an abbreviated version of this, maybe still with the big sky, you know, maybe have a, a very vertical composition um, that used a little bit more about uh, of, of Frank Rhine's approach, you know, where, where you really get in there and have a look at the, at the, uh, um, the texture of, of the wood and that kind of thing, the texture of the shingles on the roof. But in the meantime, often we see scenes like this, you know, in the distance or something very interesting where the scene overall, you know, the idea of a, you know, of a homestead in the middle of nowhere, sort of dilapidated. And we just want to experience what it's like to stand in front of something like this and to try to get the feeling of the woodwork and the dilapidated uh, shingles and the the roughness of the of the texture of the vegetation at front. That just trying to get that down in pencil some way is the goal. Um, not necessarily to to create a duplication of this scene, but just to have that experience. Us and the buildings, us and the vegetation, the big sky all the way around us. And uh, while we're talking about big sky. One of the reasons I think it is difficult to know where to stop and start on a sky is because it is so big. If we were standing out here, it's very likely that we would really feel the sense of the enormity of, of a, any big sky country all the way around us. Uh, and knowing how to, like, how do, you, how do you figure that out? How much is enough big sky, you know? Um, do I want all of that? Do I want to just concentrate on the, you know, on the buildings? And this is where something I haven't brought up for a while, but this is where the viewfinder often comes in really useful. And sometimes it's our cameras, you know, sometimes we're, we're taking a picture as well. And that sort of helps us compose, you know, how much of the sky that we need. But when you are taking a photo, uh, you do want to think about, you know, is everything that you see within that viewfinder 
accurately depicting the feeling that you have in the place where you are. And that's where the viewfinder and doing, you know, actual sketches in person is really, really helpful. All right, I'm going to move us on to the next um, stage because, of course, you'll still see the same reference. Whoops. Okay, so oh, what did I just do there? Hang on a second. Okay, so <laughs> step three. Um, so now using any any graphite pencil you have, uh, you know, whatever, you, more, more bevel pencils if you want or uh, your regular pencils or whatever, now it's time to start adding more stuff in. Uh, massing in the landscape, um, indicating some of the more obvious uh, foreground shrubbery, using your pencil direction to differentiate between foreground, midground, and the distant planes. So this was just, you know, this was me getting started on that particular step. I'm, I'm starting to go, okay, some of these, you know, I need to differentiate a little bit more what's going on in the building. I need to add some of this, uh, you know, foreground foliage in. Um, I want to show the veins on the windmill. Um, and I've got a little bit of indication of what's going to happen in the next stage with the sky. Um, a little few indicators there of, of the clouds, but I know that I've got more stuff that has to be uh, done in general on the buildings. Let me go ahead and make that small again. So what happens when you're working with, you know, a dark to mid value subject matter on toned paper is that it can be challenging to get some of the oomph that we were able to do um, when objects have more light and dark on them specifically on tone paper, because that's when you can like kind of drop that middle value stuff um, and you're concentrating only on, on the whites and the very darks. Now, when you've got these sort of mid-tone darks, you've got to have some differentiation in there. Uh, what happens is your darks end up going more to the mid-tone values that are actually the paper values. So it becomes a, a lot more challenging. And that's why um, I'm kind of concentrating on this idea of pencil stroke direction today, because that kind of helps you get, you know, get something else, get some other life into into those uh, mid-tone darks that normally would be would be done in a, in um, with just the the paper itself. And I think it becomes difficult to leave any of the paper on the uh, buildings themselves completely blank. You know, we really do end up going well. Gosh. You know, these objects, according to our NOTAN, are supposed to be darker than, you know, the surroundings, which means filling in a lot of stuff, which means uh, losing a lot of detail, losing a lot of the differentiation that we would normally put in there. So, you know, this just comes from practice. You just, there, there's never necessarily a right answer, but it's always good to dive in just like we are today and just try something, see, see what happens. You might decide, well, gosh, if I do this again, I probably would want to make, uh, I'm, I'm just going to guess, um, let's say say some of the lighter boards on the side of the building on the left. Maybe I would leave more of those blank if I, if I had this as a larger image and I could actually get into that detail. Um, you know, I, I can't think of what else I would do with it. That's one idea. Um, what I ended up doing, as you'll see in the next stage, is I ended up coming back in with the my white charcoal pencil and kind of lightening up some areas just to provide a little bit of differentiation. So there are there are many ways you can go about it. And these, whoops, whoop, let me go back again. There we go. Um, you know, these are just some of the of the potential solutions. Ah, somebody goes, when drawing the paddle of the windmill, uh, how did you draw the widest to the narrowest part of each paddle? Thank you for asking this, because what I did was um, I did go around and kind of like I, I didn't necessarily count, but I knew there were I could see there were about, you know, four paddles per section. So I needed some lines in there. Didn't draw quite as many paddles as there actually were. But I moved my page around. Um, I had an outside circle and an inside circle that I had very lightly drawn. And then I moved around and kind of just drew um, the lines like you would, have, you know, in pieces of a pie, so to speak. And then I, with my beveled pencil, I, I colored those in. And that's how I went about that. You can also, also, if you do something like that, you can neaten up the outside edge um, with an eraser. I was trying to be careful on the eraser bit uh, just because I, I knew what was going on with the pencil. But that's how I went around and, and made it as, as even as possible. So I find that, you, you know, it is useful to have a look. And, and if you can count something to actually count and see how many there are, you might decide to put, uh, less stuff up there than you actually see, just to make sure that um, you know you've got room on on your own uh, 
you know, on, on the size of drawing that you're doing to, to fit something in. But once again, what you're trying to do is give more of an indication that this is a windmill um, and not necessarily be really specific. I do think the windmill shapes are really lovely. And so on a larger drawing, I probably would be like kind of specific. I also probably would try to uh, indicate how the value on the left hand side is darker than on the right, because that's sort of interesting. And then each paddle has a little bit of a shape to it. But in a, in a five by seven drawing, I was just glad to get a general indication of the fact that there was this round thing going on. Um, now, one thing that is sort of interesting to look at as well, while, while I'm on the subject of the windmill, is looking at how when you get down to the base on the left hand side, because the light is coming from the left uh, onto this scene, how you can see the uprights as light against the dark background. This is something I noted as I was going through all of this. And I thought to myself, this is a good place to put a little bit of uh, white charcoal pencil at the end of this of this drawing, just to sort of accentuate that. So um, whether you erase back out again to kind of get those lines there, or whether you just make sure that your white charcoal pencil, you know, is heavy enough to go over the top of it. That's kind of the some of the interesting stuff that you can pull out uh, later in the drawing. Likewise, if you were doing it larger, you could just leave it um, the paper color, lots of different things. But it gives a sense of, of the realism of the scene to have those two left hand uprights be lighter than the building behind rather than just sort of make everything dark. All right, I am going to move us on to the last bit so you can just sort of see what I did with the white pencil. Oop. Okay, so at this point, uh, I added in the darkest darks I could see in the scene, added in the whites of the clouds, uh, noting that not all the cloud area is white. So I tried to vary that a little bit. I got a bit carried away with the white because <laughs> I liked it. And I was like, okay, I really want this feeling of, you know, big, big clouds and stuff. So I had a bit of fun with that. And then um, I'll show you a larger version. Um, and then just, I, I got a little uh, organic with the feeling up front. Of, of what was going on in the vegetation, um, added a little bit of white, you know, like I said, in the, in the uprights and on the roofs and this, that, and the other. Um, I found that working small like this was intensely difficult when it came to putting any detail in. So I went back in with my mechanical pencil and tried to, you know, make my windows and eaves and this, th that, and the other just a little bit more defined. I'll go back so, so you can see your picture uh, larger. So, you know, at the at the end of a drawing like this, um, you know, I looked at this and I said, well, what would I do if I was going to take this to the next step? And one thing I thought was really cool, which I hadn't explored until we got to the very end, was this vegetation up front. I mean, there's some uh, there's a real wildness and kind of activity to the way those um, the, the darker parts of the bushes, kind of the stems and the and the trunks of, of those bushes are growing that really could be um, accentuated, maybe even an almost surrealistic manner, uh, just sort of really pumping up the kind of the um, anthropomorphic feeling of those uh, in in contrast to what's going on with the very quiet buildings, the very horizontal lines of the of the, um, you know, of the slats uh, and then have that versus the wildness of the sky. So while I was thinking that and draw, working on this drawing, I tried to add a little bit of that feel in sort of as a mental note to myself, you know, hey, you could do something, you know, you could do something a bit more with this uh, vegetation up front, which would really add something interesting. In that case, if I were to do something of that nature, I would want to sort of subvert some of the detail on the buildings and actually go back and make those buildings um, a lot darker and a lot more even in tone. Because in this, in that case, the, the foreground, the excitement of the foreground need, it would need to play in contrast with the stillness of the buildings. So this is the sort of thing that you try to think about as you're going through working on your drawings, you know, working out like, like what it, what did I figure out this on this pass that's interesting to know about? And maybe, maybe you would never go back and draw this scene again, but maybe when you're in, confronted with another scene of this type, that information would come into your mind and you would go, okay, still buildings, wildness of the scene in the sky, wildness of the foliage. Let me work on that tension. So tension is that word I brought up before. 
about, uh, you know, large and small, uh, still and active, um, uh, dark and light, um, moving, not moving, uh, you know, groups of people, one person, having some type of, of differentiating factors in a drawing so that it's not, you know, here we've got three buildings and we've got a, a windmill. You know, there's a certain amount of tension there just in shape and, and number and that kind of thing. But you can take it a little bit further. And sometimes you don't really know until you're doing the drawing how that's going to happen. It's often very difficult to make that decision up front. You sort of have to go through this little mini drawing idea, uh, work out where you see interesting shapes, things that you'd accentuate. One thing I'd like to accentuate in a drawing would be on the right-hand side, the building over there, uh, the slats of the roof are really defined like, um, you know, like teeth edges, uh, um, like a saw uh, on, on the left side of that little building. And I, I'm like, oh, that's a very interesting little touch. Very hard to see at this at this size, but would be a fascinating little uh, detail to include. And you don't really see that stuff until you're actually in their drawing. So at this point, I would say, you know, you've probably worked the, the scene overall to the extent that you feel, you know, you can in the time that we have. I would just look at the drawing all over for balance. You know, do you need a little extra white here or there? Um, you know, it, it does your foliage feel foliagey? <laughs> do the sides of your buildings, you know, do they do they really have that kind of, you know, that variation and that flatness you're looking for? Your angles of your roofs, you know, pretty much okay. And then for the sky, um, I'm just going to go back to show you the, um, the sky larger. I, you know, I didn't blend or or soften that at all. Now, often I do, um, you know, often a sky like in those little travel pictures I showed you up front, I've subverted it by either blending with my finger or uh, blending most of it and only having a few white highlights just where the whitest part of the of the clouds are. But I liked the idea of the activity and not necessarily trying to depict the scene, uh, you know, in a photographic sense. So these are all decisions you can make. Um, I will say about clouds when when they're light white clouds like this, it can be harder to know what to draw, which bits you want to have in there. Um, the dark rainy clouds from the class a couple of weeks ago where we did the Dolman portal, so much easier, you know, very dark versus very light shining from above. Here, these clouds are thinner. There's a lot more light bouncing around, a little bit harder to determine. So once again, you know, you can squint or if you don't want to get wrinkles, you can just close your eyes almost completely and try to figure out, you know, what's the What's the shape and the movement that you see in the white for the tone paper that you'd like to accentuate and go that way? Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I'm hoping that this subject matter and, and this sort of approach to drawing is becoming a little bit more familiar now. I'm trying to remember what we're doing next week so I can tell you about how to be prepared. Hmm. <laughs> Can't quite remember. Okay, I'll see if it comes back to me before the end of the class. All right, folks, uh, let's wrap this up and I'm going to go ahead and, and finish off for today. All right, so this is just a quick trip through through what we've done and kind of how to approach something like a landscape uh, when you're dealing with toned paper. I'm really keen on, on you getting you know, the fun of toned paper down. And also this idea of using your pencils as tools, uh, you know, to do the work you need them to, to get, to get a drawing done quickly, to get a sketch done quickly. Um, because it's not so much about, you know, how to, to do each step just perfectly as it is to do a number of sketches, uh, incorporating the ideas of what you see and then, and then work out from that what is the best technical approach that you would like to use to do um, something that did take you two or three hours or four hours or whatever to draw? Because this, this information, all of this testing out, all of this trying out, the NOTAN, the little sketch with the de directions, all of that, that's all part of being able to get to a scene that actually works. I know I could take this sketch I have here and work up something based on everything I have just learned 
through this last hour, but it would be very difficult for me to start with a blank piece of paper and, and get the feeling of life that I would want to keep in the drawing without having gone through these particular stages. So really simple because we've done tone paper before, so I'm not going to beat, um, beat this into your heads, but the idea of using a scene to represent a feeling or an action or an idea. In this case, you know, we've got the big sky, the, the loneliness of the buildings, the dilapidated buildings are really accentuated by the fact that we have all of this sky going on. There aren't any little figures in there. If we, if we draw a scene like this larger, we can make that even more clear uh, you know, the, the half opened doors, the, um, the, you know, the fact that there aren't, there's no glass in the windows, that kind of thing, you know, all sort of lends to that same feeling. But what really gives that feeling is the idea of these still objects in this wildness of vegetation up front and the wildness of sky and the real, real stillness that we see in the middle there. And Often these ideas aren't really revealed to us until we really take some time to look Look for the tension, look for the contrast, and figure out what our pencils are and aren't going to do to help us get us there. So use everything that you can in a landscape to get a feeling of atmosphere. Sometimes you won't need the sky at all. It's just a backdrop. You just need some interesting light shapes back there, and that's fine. It's all about the buildings or whatever up front. Other times, you know, using what's around you to actually create the feeling of standing out there and looking at the scene is really useful. So uh, when it comes to technique, as you now well know, <laughs> uh, tone paper really lends itself to landscape drawing, and it gives you an opportunity to uh, deal with clouds as useful elements, and rather something that you know is like, oh, how do I do this? How do I how do I get clouds in here to look halfway decent? Um, let the textures in the scene suggest which tools to use. In other words, um, bevel pencil. You know, lots of detail with a thin pencil or a mechanical pencil. Uh, do you need to smudge things? Are we on tone paper? Therefore, you know, white charcoal is good. So, you know, all of this you now have as part of your, your toolbox when it comes to drawing. Sometimes it just takes a little practice to figure out which ones you want to use where. Uh, let the textures of the scene suggest the tools. It's just so, uh, so useful to, to really go, okay, is this spiky? Is it flat? Is it you know, is it distant? Is it close? And then once again, thinking about what you're drawing while you're drawing it. In this case, the rundown old homestead. It's just really, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, dilapidated buildings over our lifetime. So we have a, we have an understanding of what that can look like and perhaps how to exaggerate and accentuate that a little bit. All right, folks, let me stop sharing here. Okay, so I'm hoping that that was a relatively accessible, uh, you know, if, if a little bit detailed type of drawing to have to do. But I, I really do hope that during the course of this summer, you get a chance to go out and draw something and have this idea that having a couple of beveled pencils on hand might be a way to help you deal with buildings in particular. I think buildings are very difficult for us to deal with. We, we have a tendency to want to outline them. Um, and, and really, we can go at them from a point of texture, uh, directional line, and all of that sort of thing. Likewise, trees. We've got a lot of trees with leaves on right now, uh, giving a little bit of a chance to sort of, you know, work with, with the beveled pencils for textures might be helpful. Okay. I do not remember what we're doing next week, <laughs> although I've got the class already planned out. So it'll be a surprise for both of us. Um, when I send around the follow-up PDF, I'll let you know if it's white paper or tone paper that we're working with, and we can at least start with that, and I'll give you some more information about how to be ready. But in the meantime, thanks so much for joining me today in the studio, and I hope you have a really great week uh, drawing, and uh, thanks again for your time.